Hello. This is the Fight Back Podcast, hosted by exercise scientist Georgia Verry. Here, you'll find a series of honest conversations about martial arts and mental health. My guests and I explore the statement that every martial artist has heard. Martial arts saved me. How and why do combat sports save people? Listen to find out. Hey there, Conscious Combat Soul. What, you? Yes, I'm talking to you. If you listen to this podcast, then you are a human being who loves combat and wants to be conscious about the way that you're doing it. You're interested in being more trauma-informed, more inclusive, and more ethical in the way that you teach and participate in martial arts and combat sports. And that's why I would like to invite you specifically to join our new group, the Conscious Combat Club. We're on Facebook, and there's an emailing newsletter that you can sign up for, the details for both of which are in the show notes here. But now, let's get to today's episode. So welcome to the Fight Back podcast, everyone. I am here today with Eric Hine, the teacher of all teachers, okay? So he has been a teacher of phys ed teachers, a martial arts teacher, um, a teacher of police, uh, teaching people who perform under pressure. And I think I'm probably missing some. Essentially, his whole life is a mixture of teaching and martial arts. So Eric, welcome to the podcast. Yes, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Yes. My absolute pleasure. I'm really looking forward to get to know, looking forward to getting to know you better over the course of this next hour. So for everyone listening as well, can you please tell us a bit more about you? Yes. Okay. So you mentioned that uh, the, the red line in my life is about teaching. Mm-hmm. I'm 52 now. And when I look back, it's all about teaching. So I started teaching in martial arts. I started with uh, Kyukushin Karate, mm-hmm. which maybe important for later which really saved my life because i had a very troubled youth and so i i became involved in martial arts and strangely enough from 17 or 18 years old i started teaching in in karate and later on in kickboxing and so on and then i made a professional career about it uh, out of it so i started teaching um uh, uh sport teachers mm-hmm. we have like in we have educational programs in holland so if you want to teach here in holland whatever you want to teach you have to you you have to get your diploma Mm -hmm. a certificate yeah and then i had a 15 years uh, stint in police uh training Mm -hmm. where i was a a firearms and defensive tactics instructor which is also very interesting because it's a huge gap from martial arts to um, police defensive tactics and I learned a lot about uh, the, the psychological impact of using violence mm. and also about the, uh, yeah, sorry for my English. So I don't have all the terms, but uh, uh, juridical, the, the law. Mm-hmm. So in martial arts, we always did, did, did all the things and we kicked and punched and whatever. And, and never asking ourselves if, it, if it's legal or moral. Mm. And then I was with the police. And now everything was under a big, uh, how do you call it? It was always. Well, okay. un- under the law, yeah. right? With Yeah, um... under the law. Yeah. So I learned a lot about that. Also, uh, the, 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 uh, the emotional and psychological stress mm-hmm. when just uh, touching people or when you uh, arresting control techniques. So that was the police part. Then and now... Uh, the last years I started to work for myself mm-hmm. as a, it's a little bit expensive word, but it's like advisor consultant for police ambulance. So for emergency medicine, which is so great. And I, I developed programs for performing under pressure. Mm-hmm. When you talk about performing under pressure, you also have to do with people uh, who uh, see very, intensive things so you mm-hmm. come in ptsd and, mm-hmm. and trauma mm-hmm. also in, in in that in that kind of work eh? and for three days a week i work as a uh, teacher at the physical education i'm not sure at the physical education program we call it here applied university yes the, the highest uh, it's not university but underneath so my students become physical education teachers also 
cool. Yeah, we call that like oh, about... TAFE. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I the, the nice thing is I, I had periods in my life where I thought I want to get out of teaching because I don't know, because it's teaching is for, for me in Holland, we call it uh, lesgeven. Um, the word giving shit mm -hmm. is in, in the Dutch word and it's a lot about giving. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you are like me, very passionate, you give a lot and, and so some periods in my life, I thought maybe I will, I will, I will quit teaching and <laughs> I'm not sure what to do then, but man, it's in my blood. I cannot do otherwise. Yeah. I, there's a saying that's quite common these days, particularly on social media, which is about like making sure that you fill your cup or, you know, yeah. you can't pour from an empty cup. And yeah. for sure, as you were speaking, I was thinking, you know, Sometimes you can see it like that. We're teaching. You're always giving. You're always pouring into other people's yeah. cups. But it's yeah. not always so black and white, right? You, If you no. walk away from teaching, you might realize that actually somehow it was a bit of a cycle because as I was pouring into their cups, that was giving me fulfillment and joy, even though it didn't absolutely. always feel like it. Yeah, absolutely. And now uh, I, uh, I have accepted the fact that I'm a teacher. <laughs> yeah. But man, I, I the, for the last five, six years, because I went from, from the police, which, which are adults, of course, mm -hmm. and, and emergency medicine. And now I'm teaching students at the age of uh, 18, 19, 20. Mm. And first I thought, mm, I'm not sure if I can do this again. But now it's, then, then I started doing it and I'm really loving it because... I feel, you know, the stages in life of Eric Erickson, the great psychologist. Tell everyone, please. Oh, well, he, he developed a model, Eric Erickson, uh, about uh, the, what is important in life mm -hmm. as a teenager, as an adult, and, and at, at, my, and at, at 52. And he has a kind of a ladder. And then uh, if you are arrived at 50, you are more interested in um, passing on mm -hmm. and no, not so much in developing your own ego and how do you call it um uh, making a living career for yourself and, yes. and i feel that that's so nice so back in the days i was also busy with myself mm -hmm. when teaching mm -hmm. because i wanted to be the best and whatever and of course it gives you a little bit st status status mm -hmm. but now uh, i'm i have more more space for the also for the students yes and that's so nice to more like mentoring, you know, and yes. Yeah. I'm not interested. I'm not so interested in myself anymore. And that's, that's, that, that's beautiful. It gives you a beautiful, peaceful mind. And then I can watch all those young people and it's beautiful. Yeah. Is interfering. No. yeah. All good. All good. Um, yeah. things are so different in Holland, I think, than the rest of the world, you know, there's, there's much more structure around teaching, which is really yeah. cool. Um, and I yeah. want to dig into some of what makes a good teacher and what we yeah. spoke a bit about offline, the, yeah. the motor learning piece. But first, I just have this burning train of thought, which is, it's interesting that you did the work with the police, right? With people mm -hmm. who are working in high pressure situations and you yeah. alluded to how that relates to PTSD and trauma because you are seeing things like people in horrific accidents and, mm -hmm. and people committing yes. crimes and chases and things like that. Yeah. So my first introduction to this idea of like fight or flight, rest and digest, apart from university, was a book called On Combat. Yeah. I can't think of the author, but I'll put it David in the show Crosby. notes. Yes, right? So I read that book because, funnily enough, I work with the police as well, not in um, defensive tactics, but in exercise science. Yeah. And one of the policemen that I was working with, the sergeant, he said he recommended the book, right? Mm -hmm. So the book talks all about, for people who haven't read it, it's essentially a synopsis of what happens physiologically when mm -hmm. you need to be ready for combat all the time and how can we make sure that we stay calm during combat so that we don't go into these so-called red zones and then be mm -hmm. unable to do what we call critical thinking where you can yeah. analyze good information yeah. and I come back to that all the time uh, when I coach people who have experienced trauma and when we talk about 
in what kind of state can you learn well? And these are all going to yeah. tie in together. And certainly your yeah. life's work are all very interrelated. Um, yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about that? What was the work with the police and, and what are some of the considerations for working under high pressure? Well, that's a very big question. Um, so I worked as a firearms instructor and as a defensive tactics instructor. I worked with some elite units and also with, um, well, let's say uh, a kind of undercover uh, work, which is mm -hmm. also very, uh, very tensing because there's also always the fear of being recognized and so on. Mm. Um, but the strange thing is, and I see it also in the emergency medicine at the, at the at the one hand, you have to, you have to, well, let's say, compartmentalize, compartmentalize, compartmentalize. Yeah, like because if you take it all personally and mm -hmm. you are very empathic, then then it, then every day, I mean, that that's a big big burden. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of dissociate a little bit and, and using violence, also very strange, eh? using violence as a tool, mm. not as an emotion, but as a tool. I was lucky enough that I did martial arts. So for me, it was not a, not a, not a, not a problem to, well, it sounds so strange if I say it, but you know what I mean. A punch, it becomes a tool. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, uh you see and you experience a lot of things so and, and as we all know the body keeps the score so it, mm -hmm. it, it it comes in your head and i have heard people say maybe it's better to become a robot mm -hmm. uh like not uh, not letting it uh into your system but at the same time there are psychologists I did not tell you, but I'm, I studied also psychology, mm -hmm. not clinical psychology, but uh, organizational psychology. So I did a lot of study about that also. So at the same time, you have to uh, keep in touch with, with your emotions and your inner life. So that's a delicate, that's the delicate balance. Mm -hmm. And now the performance on the pressure piece, which is very hot mm -hmm. internationally and here in Holland. I think that's the easy no, yeah, that's the easy part in the sense there is a lot of sport psychology and mm -hmm. there's a lot of performance psychology to make programs to perform at a high stake acute moment. Yes. And for example, as you know, uh, the best, I, I, I have made a model of the three R's. It's mm -hmm. about re register, regulate and reflect. Mm -hmm. So the first, the, the first part is uh, uh, recognize that that stress is um, uh, taking over. That's mm -hmm. the first part. And then regulate. And for regulation, we have a lot of tools for which I think external focus, task focus is the primary. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, you have to self-regulate. Well, in, and there's a lot of research coming out now also in Holland about, uh, about breeding. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 I think the most important thing, did, do you know the Jocko Willing podcast and Andrew Huberman led? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do know both, uh, but explain for everyone. Okay. Well, Jocko Willing is a retired Navy SEAL, mm -hmm. uh, a platoon commander, and he has uh, a, a great podcast about, about this topic, about mm -hmm. what is violence and, and how do you operate in such a world and how do you... How do you uh, uh, come back healthy mm -hmm. and andre huberman is a neuroscientist from stanford to the mm -hmm. huberman lab and his podcast is exploded the last years yes and he talks about the neuroscience about everything and and they talk about uh stepping back and take a broad view mm. and these are both physiological processes because stepping back and taking a broad view means uh, your eyes you get a broad view and your eyes are parts of your brain yes and you literally you literally uh you, you broaden your perspective in your picture and mm -hmm. if you combine that with a good breeding protocol um that is that that the worthwhile strategies but the thing is i think which i come up which i'm confronted confronted with now with is performance under pressure is like in the moment you know it's mm. Uh, like we call it in America, they call it left of bang. So you have the, the bang is the, the the moment. Yes. And left is before and right, and right is, of course, after it. Uh -huh. 
But the way you perform in the acute moment, my intuition is also depends on what did you did before, not only in operational, mm. but also what is your, what is your, um, yeah, how is your life going? <laughs> yes. Yes, so if, totally. if, if your if your baseline is like I'm very stressed, I have a relationship problems, I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating well, I'm exercising, and then, but I'm but I'm still doing the two day course with Eric about performing under pressure. Then I think ah, that's it. That's that's a kind of hmm. yeah. All those pieces. Your your basic your basic lifestyle your also your preparation work if you're um, I'm not sure how how they call it in English but if I if I get a how do you call it from the uh, melding if I if I got a call to yes. go to uh, domestic violence ah yes well for example well most of the times of a, a lot of people uh, go into the guards race race to the domestic violence and then regulate themselves but then then you miss a big part it's a preparation part mm -hmm. especially uh when when before arriving you can regulate yourself mm. and you can regulate others so there is a lot more that's that's oh i'm, I'm now very uh broad talking but it was a very is, broad question <laughs> yeah but the thing is so performing on the pressure is not like is not only in that moment yes for example, also nice to maybe for if you. I'm a huge. I'm 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 in love with with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for the last uh, thirty years, and it's the same because uh, if I'm if I'm not sleeping and I've, if I'm not eating, I'm I'm going to class. I can have all the tricks and and performance on the pressure strategies, but I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. So this is a broad way of saying that performance on the pressure it's a time scale you have the acute moment and you have all those moments to before and and important also afterwards yeah what do you, you know, do afterwards what it makes me think of is like on this podcast almost every episode we talk about the window of tolerance yeah right and um, and i will often talk about well that's where learning takes place is usually inside your window of tolerance sometimes just outside your window but for the most yeah. part inside your window of tolerance and what affects your window of tolerance well your life situations what's happened to yes. you in the past how you perceived those events but also yeah. how well you slept if you slept well versus poorly it's going to yeah. drastically change the size of your window and again how you can learn rationally think and perform under pressure i think these are all yeah. Kind of just different different terminology, different language for explaining the same sort of things, which are we need to learn how to. And, and it's funny, I learned a different three R's when I was working um, with Mark and Mariah, who run the trauma informed weightlifting course through the Justice mm. Research Institute, which is, of course, under Bessel van der Kolk, yeah. um, where they talk about regulate, relate, then reason. Mm. And nice people often approaching distress the opposite way, right? We use reason first, logic. Oh, you shouldn't yeah, be yeah. upset because da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Whereas you would, like you said, right? Regulate yourself first or regulate the other person first and, and have tools to know how to do that. And of course, that's like you mentioned, the preparation part. You can't just access yes. tools. You need to True. learn them. And, and for, for, me, the, the, for me, the second R, R, what is it called? R? R. Sorry, the first part is is uh, we call it registering register register. Yeah, so it's it's mainly it's uh, it, it's 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 about interoception mm -hmm. or neuroception. Yes, because because if you don't recognize that something is going on, mm. be it physiological or psychological, then what what do you have to recognize? So or the programs, for example, I teach a two day program for ambulance personnel. The mm -hmm. first day we are only asking them, how are you feeling, like like arousal wise, mm -hmm. uh, effect wise, mm -hmm. and ju just being aware of yourself. Mm -hmm. And 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 after that we are going to the regulation tools. Yes. 
And do you use any specific tools for um, registering, for example, scaling? So how, how is your arousal on a scale of one to 10 yeah. or do you use location yes. or both? How does that look like? No, the most, uh, the most simple ways, like you said, on a scale of one or 10, mm -hmm. what is your arousal? Mm -hmm. and, and then people say, and then what you also can do then is, okay, this is okay, great. But sometimes, and that's very interesting also, uh, then I ask people, for example, uh, to count their breaths for a minute mm -hmm. or to observe each other's breath for a minute. Mm -hmm. So if you say my arousal level is four, mm -hmm. but you're breathing uh, 18 times a minute, mm -hmm. that's also uh, like uh, not, not, uh, not, not coherent. Yes. Because that, that's so like the, the bread count, for example, is a nice object, objective measure. And then you yes. can have a disc, then you have, can have a nice conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, okay, this is what you're, what, you're, what you're thinking about yourself. This is what happened. You can also use, of course, uh, uh, tools like Omega Wave, which measures RFV. Mm -hmm. So you can do a lot, but this is the most, this is the most uh, simple one to ask. And then I do like, uh, this is the scale from one to 10. Then mm -hmm. I, from arousal, Mm -hmm. And then I put a other line up in it. Uh, do I'm not sure. Do you know the the effect effect grid? Explain it to everyone. Yeah. So you have the arousal score from mm -hmm. zero to ten, mm -hmm. and you have a scale. Uh, if you find that arousal pleasurable, or the opposite. Mm -hmm. So if you say I'm aroused like mm -hmm. a seven, and it feels uh, pleasurable. Then you give words to it. Maybe you're enthusiast, enthusiastic, or you uh, you curious. Mm -hmm. So this comes from the work of uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett. So yes. it's a way of um, uh, giving name, giving label your your feelings. It's mm -hmm. not it's not an emotion uh, yet, but it's uh, it's it's on the way to uh, emotional intelligence. For sure, and it's very it's it's very nice because the, sometimes people say, "Ah, oh, I am." Um, I feel uh, not energized, so I'm uh, on the scale from one to ten. I'm uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm locked out uh, mm -hmm. at two. Mm -hmm. and I also find it uh, unpleasurable. Mm -hmm. so that's like a bit, but like somberness or like, a... and just to label it and to, I do a lot of uh, talking with each other. I'm not like the front. I'm not in the front of the class and all the, do all the talking. So I have mm -hmm. a lot of interaction. That they have very nice conversations of it. So this is this is a little bit what I do when with uh, reg registering. Yes. Okay. And of course, so you can do you, you can do body scans and whatever if you have time. Yeah, and that will feed into as well the um, regulate right. If you yeah, if you're doing a body scan as part of that, well, that's also going to regulate your nervous system at the same time yeah. as registering it. Yeah. True. And remind me again, what was the third R? reflecting what does that look like it means that for example first you register your arousal or your stress or your whatever your pressure mm -hmm. then um then you uh, uh use some uh use some uh, regulation tools mm -hmm. and then of course you want to learn from it so for example i have a, re a resuscitation mm -hmm. I register my stress is very, very high. I do mm -hmm. some uh, regulation tool. And then the, the reflection part is uh, looking back on what happened and if the regulation and the uh, recognition worked. Mm -hmm. So that it makes a circle round. It's about, it's about, about learning. I From love this. To, yeah. Yeah. So if we break this down or give another example, maybe that um, yeah. makes practical sense for listeners of this show who almost certainly do martial arts, right? Yeah. Um, and many may be trauma survivors or many may not. And we all yeah. need to register our emotions and regulate um, yeah. and reflect. So if you think perhaps say, so you go to a class yeah. and you have been regularly practicing registering. So maybe you have a practice where at the start of class, you say, okay, on a scale of one to 10, yeah. what is my arousal? I am a five. Is it positive or negative? It's a positive. I'm excited about going to class. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Things are all going well until we start sparring. And yeah. then I'm at a seven and it's negative. I'm feeling stressed 
And yeah. the reason I was feeling stressed is because I didn't set a boundary and I got partnered with someone who I knew yeah. um, was unsafe for me. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But I guess that would come up in the reflection. So that happens, say, objectively. And then yeah. there was that stress. So you would notice, okay, registering, this is how I'm feeling. Maybe you say, excuse me, I need to take a break. And you go and yeah. you count your breaths for a minute. You come back. Then after class, you might have a journal and you would write down when yes. this happened. Then I felt like this. I calm myself using this. Next time I will set yes. the boundary. But also I learned that breathing works for me or maybe it didn't work and so on. Wonderful. I could not say it better. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so good. All right. I'm going to get yeah. everybody to start doing this. And, and certainly um, so you might be familiar with the book Transforming Trauma with Jiu-Jitsu. Yes. Um, and so we had the authors on recently on the podcast yeah. and they talk about scaling. And I was like, true, absolutely. We always talk about yeah. intensity as some vague thing. Let's start scaling. But I love yeah. the reflect piece. It really does, like you um, showed before, take it full circle. And I'm, yeah. I'm drawing a circle, right? It, it, it links yeah. it back to something that you can then build upon and continue to improve, which I think is one of the wonderful things about martial arts is they are yeah. tools for us to learn that information about ourselves without high pressure. You don't know yeah. how you respond to high pressure and you don't know, you know, um, what to do next time when it's an unexpected high pressure situation. Yeah, yeah true. The, the, the delicate thing is that it so much depends on the teacher mm. because uh, as uh, Jamie and Anna also talked about in your podcast, that uh, there are also, uh, I don't want to say a lot of, but there, there, there are gyms, whatever, if it's kickboxing or not, or, or, or BGG, where the teacher is, is, is not a good teacher. And yes. I'm not even talking about being trauma-informed, but being, um, for example, uh, there is a Danish researcher, I think it's Tony, he will also participate in my new book. Mm -hmm. And he talks about uh, unhealthy rituals in BGG. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, with the testing that you have to walk through a row and you get hit with a, with a how do you call it? A belt. Belt and so on. So there are also very unhealthy uh, rituals. And most important, recently I came to the, to the great work about co-regulation from mm -hmm. polyphagal theory. Yes. And for me, it means that, that the way I express myself, so the way I talk, the tone of my voice, the way my, my face mm -hmm. has a huge impact on the participants of my class. And if I'm reflecting back on that, because you talk about the, the, the woman or the, 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 the boy who walks into the class and is anxious or not, but... The teacher is so important. Mm -hmm. he, his, uh, his behavior, I mean, it's a, about feeling safe or not safe or feel, feeling threatened or... Definitely. I, I cannot say, yeah. Absolutely. I often say on this podcast and otherwise, there's not one best martial art. It's not jujitsu is the best, kickboxing is no. the best, kyokushin is the best. It's where is there a great teacher and culture at the club? That's yeah. it. True. And I am have, I, I, I have made so many mistakes, still making mistakes. For example, now when I'm teaching, I am, because I'm enthusiastic and, and passionate, sometimes I look like this and, or have no facial expression at all. And but I know it, but sometimes it happens. And I, I can feel students, you know, walking a little bit around me. Mm -hmm. they, are not, they are not sure, uh, because I ask them, eh? they are not sure um, if it's <laughs> the right opportunity to ask some questions and so on. So, so I, have to, I have to work on it to, okay, they are coming, put on, uh, put on a, a, a nice face, not fake. Mm -hmm. But because I know I'm, I'm from, from my personality, I'm like, I'm like busy and you know, the fronting, I know. Yeah. Frowning. Yes. Yes. Frowning. So I am, um, and making people safe, mm -hmm. making people safe. And I experienced it, this myself because 
And now I'm go I'm going uh, all the way, or so please call me back. But <laughs> keep going, uh, keep going. For now, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, for now, I'm happy. No, be, because uh, uh, I grew up as a um, w- when I was six years old. My my father died, and my mother was a psych- psychiatric uh, patient. Yes. So she, she, I have a lovely mother, but she, uh, she, she could not. Uh, be there for me so i i became on the st- i, I, I uh, lived on the streets mm-hmm. in the north of holland at a very young age because i'm talking about seven or eight wow and i uh, i i came on the streets with uh, enormous violence mm-hmm. like drugs alcohol uh, uh hooligans whatever as, mm-hmm. as a very young child and, and 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 i was also very insecure attached so i i had all the determinants of of going going wrong Mm -hmm. and it went very wrong and but uh luckily enough they sent me to a uh, i'm not sure what it is it's uh we call it internat here they saw they sent me to a place uh out of out of the environment and it was like a um, institution for troubled kids yes so okay then it was there and then I don't know why or how, but then I came. Then I went to a karate school, mm-hmm. and and they they did the magic. They did the magic because they they knew my name. If I when I went there, they they said, "Hey, Eric, uh, fine, you're here." Mm-hmm. So there was the re- re- relateness component eh, of the self determination theory. Yes. Uh, for the first time, uh, uh, adults. Uh, uh, saw things I could do good. Yes. So when I when I you know when I first made a good uh, kick or my gear or whatever, mm-hmm. you you felt competent in doing things like that. So and 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 there was the the ability to be me. So all the three basic psychological needs were met, and mm-hmm. that was the magic. And um, I'm not I'm not sure why I'm t- telling you this. Yeah, because the importance of the teacher. Yes. Because I could easily, and especially in Holland, because later on I went to kickboxing. Mm-hmm. And uh, in Holland, although we have a lot of champions here, kickboxing was and still is heavily influenced by criminality and mm-hmm. the underworld. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you can easily go very, very bad here mm-hmm. in Holland as a youngster. Yes. Wow. You mentioned a term, self-determination theory. Yes. I want to cycle back to that. What is yeah. that? It's a theory of, uh, of uh, it's a bro theory. Self-determination means, uh, um, it's difficult to, for me to explain in English, but it means um, to be able to, to determine your own path in life. Yes. And, 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 and the, the basic premise is that we, as, we as humans have a in it, uh, force to grow and to broaden our experience and so on and so on mm-hmm. and daisy and ryan uh, di- in 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 this it's a very big theory it's a it, it's used everywhere mm-hmm. and inside the te- theory there are uh, smaller theories and one of them is the the psychological needs theory mm-hmm. and um, in their research they came up with three psychological needs mm-hmm. it's, it's important to mention the psychological needs because you have also like the physiological needs, like yes. the Maslow pyramid, which he did not draft anyway, but it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but the three needs are uh, relate relatedness. You, uh-huh. you relatedness. Say, relatedness. Relatedness. Yes. Yes. To belong to belong to a group to to feel safe also with a group, mm-hmm. um, and then the second component is competence. Mm-hmm. to be uh, effective in in the things you do so to to have a certain influence in your life you can say mm-hmm. feeling competent and the third one is autonomy mm-hmm. which i translate as um the ability uh, sorry no, the possibility to to do it also also on your own way in yes. your own style and to have some you can say in education to give people choices to give children a choice mm-hmm. I, it's a very you can you can there's a very broad theory but these three components are beautiful to work with because mm. 
if you are aware of it, you can. Uh, yeah, I use it. Uh, I'm. Uh, I, I use it uh, with my students. I use it with the programs. I uh, so if 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 students come into my class, I want to uh, come in contact. Mm -hmm. we, say, we always say relation for uh, contact before contract. Just first the contact part. Yes. Feeling related, mm -hmm. belonging to the group. Mm -hmm. Then have a very good methodology of teaching so that mm -hmm. they become competent. Mm -hmm. And also very important then also give them some autonomy. And, and for example, Eve, uh, you talked about with Jamie and Anna, especially with trauma uh informed mm -hmm. classes the, the the part of autonomy in, mm -hmm. in choosing and control is very important absolutely so to summarize what makes a good teacher is a teacher who can build relationships um yes. both with the students directly but also create an environment where students have relationships with each other yeah to bring students to a level of competence where they feel like they have self-efficacy or yes. they have experiential confidence. And it's interesting, confidence and community are the two things in my research, which is not peer reviewed, but still that come up over and over again yeah. about um, what people find is the transformative part in martial yeah. arts um, and that you give them choice that they get to yeah. have some input into what they're studying, into what they do. And, you know, when I think about striking, I think about you have infinite choice so many times over. Every time yeah. you break, which is often in Kyokushin, for example, there's no grabbing allowed. Yeah. Um, in kickboxing, there's not really any grabbing allowed. And, and even in Muay Thai, you have many options within the clinch. So at any point you can decide, do I want to kick? Do I want to punch? Do I want yeah. an elbow? Uh, when you break, how am I going to re-engage? When they do a technique, how do I want to block yeah. it? Um, so I can totally see how martial arts give that. But also there are coaches, many, who try to create what we would call carbon copies of themselves. Yeah. You know, this is how I'd fight. So this is how all my students will fight yeah, in my style. True. But a good coach will see, ah, uh, Eric has a different body yeah. type to me, different preferences. How can I help him strengthen his strengths and build his own style rather yes. than copy my style? But this this last this last part you you talk about, this was not common in my experience in Holland because mm -hmm. when when I started with karate, I also started with Kyokushin karate, mm -hmm. and now I'm I'm the what do you call it coordinator of the Dutch karate educational program. So yes. I'm still working with karate teachers in their mm -hmm. teaching program, but it's very much the Eastern thing. Like uh, the sensei tells what to do, and you you just copy it. Mm -hmm. So the the autonomy part, they find it very difficult to accept because yes. And autonomy also means for me a little bit like emancipation. So okay. autonomy means for me also that also my students, this is this is another theory of Gert, Gert Bichstein. He's a, he's a great educational philosopher. Mm -hmm. He calls it subjectivation as a goal of education. But what it means is that um, one of the goals of my education is also that my students can say, uh, that they can say no. That they can that they can that they can say, yes. Eric, thank you for thank you for this this uh, this suggestion this, uh, suggestion. But I I I think I have for me personally I have a better uh, suggestion or solution. And that that's also uh, yeah that's what I call emancipation. Mm -hmm. So they have to. They, I must be able to to give them the safety to tell me. So, for example, where uh, I invite my students uh, at the Academy of Physical Education, I uh, advise my students. Sometimes I ask them after this big uh, co collation, uh, mm -hmm. after this big, uh, what do you call it, talk, yes, with hundreds of students in the in the room. I say, I, at least one of you should come to me and tell me what was wrong about my lecture. Mm -hmm. Just to invite them to think, because mm -hmm. what do I know? I'm I'm just, and that's yes. a beautiful. Uh, and and also within police, uh, because also very hier hierarchical. Yes, hierarchical. 
yeah but 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 at the same time we recognize that we need we need problem solvers we need also the people who say uh maybe we should do it uh, otherwise it's, it's very worthwhile yes uh, so much yes and i think one of the key words that you said there was invite right yeah. um i invite students to come to do this and yeah. when you invite people they have the capacity to be able to say no but if you order people well, then it becomes very difficult to, to feel like you are allowed yeah. to say no. And, and like you touched on, right, safety is really key there. It's yeah. not just empty words. You could say, I invite you to, but you have a really stern look on your face and you're frowning and, and everybody in the room is going like, yeah, but he doesn't really mean it. I'm not actually allowed to challenge yeah. the, the instruction from the sensei yeah. um, is, is one of the reasons why I often say, at the moment, we're saying trauma-informed teaching, but really that's just good teaching, right? Yeah, in the true. future, everybody yeah. should, should yeah. teach in a way where students feel that they yeah. have a voice. Yeah, true. But this was so great to mention it because when I, was, uh, when I was thinking about this podcast and I listened to Jamie and Anna, who are also participating because I'm writing a book about uh, uh, martial arts as therapy mm -hmm. with a contribution, of these uh, two great authors. Mm -hmm. But I also thought, what is trauma-informed martial arts? Because if you are a good teacher, I mean, you, you are sensitive to your students with all their whereabouts, you know? But, uh, but at the same time, it's good to, to, to put a label on it for, for a while so that we become more... Uh, uh, because it helped me a lot because... Uh, I have uh, even the, the the last year I had so many things happening in my uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu classes mm -hmm. at the academy where where I was not sen sensitive to my students. Mm -hmm. So I had, for example, uh, a, a girl. We're talking about 19, 20 years old, so not 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 uh, like uh, six years. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, she came in with a like a face like this, you know, very frowning face, and she she did make contact with me. So I thought uh, I, I was ah, I, I felt not good about it, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe she doesn't like uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and so on. So mm -hmm. the first weeks I gave no attention. I I, I uh, uh, ne uh, how do you call it? I neglected her a little yes. bit. Like yes. uh, I'm I do not want to interfere with my. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, then we did a, a joke, mm -hmm. and I told I told everybody it was not like inviting. It was just we are practicing this joke right now. Mm -hmm. And then, then she she didn't make the joke with the with, with the girlfriend. So she she did her hands, but not not on the how do you call it the, the, neck. the neck where it where the joke yeah. And then I became a little bit frustrated and 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 tell, told her like uh, come on. Uh, make the joke and then after and th then it went a little bit like this and then i suddenly realized i mean i'm not sure maybe she has a very bad experience uh mm -hmm. I, i'm not sure and afterwards i talked with her um and she felt very unsafe mm. she felt unsafe uh by the way i i, I teach it that class because i'm i'm a brazilian youtube practitioner for, so for me it's like uh, brushing my teeth mm -hmm. i'm 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 rolling the whole time with man woman and it's just normal mm -hmm. but for her it was like even even with her girlfriend and putting hands on each other and 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 uh, she had a very bad experience uh Yes. So that for me, it's it was very important to. Um, and and also, for example, I saw uh, a lot of girls uh, when we did a sparring mm -hmm. at the physical education teaching program. We did the sparring. There were five girls who who kept out. Yeah. I was thinking, uh, huh? come on, yeah, we're rolling. Where? Uh, but then I think then I thought, well, let me let me tackle this otherwise, and I, I just asked them. Uh, do you not like it or whatever? And uh, they told me, yes, we like it very much, but we don't want to roll with the guys. Mm -hmm. So, okay, what is a good solution? Well, let us roll with each other. So, okay, that's, that's so. And then it went perfect. But 
the thing is also for me with and teaching a long time being uh, being I don't know how do you call it uh, conscious of of these things is very yes. important yes definitely and I think you're right like we need this language at the moment because the overwhelming majority of teachers it's it's sad to say but unfortunately it's the majority who don't have that awareness who would see the True. student come into the class frowning and yell at them and be like you're being yeah. rude to me right yeah um, and very much have themselves at the center of the class and don't yes. think about what's happening for the other person and that is very much entrenched in a lot of culture in martial arts yeah. and, and it's quite unfortunate and so we do need a label that tells people who yes. have that perception of martial arts that in this space actually it will be different and you will be safe and and that should yeah. be the status quo but it's not so we need the yeah. language at the moment it's not in my mind it's not trauma informed it's just humane living and treatment of other people however that's not the norm so we need the language to be able yes, to distinguish that's, it you, you put it great that's exactly in two sentences what i told in five minutes yes. but with the we, with the quantifiable yeah the examples was good the examples we, we good. need we need a language that's true yeah yeah eric we've talked about how people can use the three r's to mm -hmm improve the way that they train for coaches could even integrate this as a system as part of their classes we've also spoken about how for coaches to have an awareness of how they create community how they relate um, how they give students autonomy and how they get them to a level of um, understanding where they feel competent being yeah. things to work towards and if you're planning yeah. out a lesson a lesson plan or a class structure these are things to think about would you have any other advice for coaches who are listening that think i want to become a better teacher yeah that's a big question and a very good question but i think um i think this, this part is the most important part because mm. this is about uh, human development. I have to do the, the Gordon's. Go for it. Because, yeah. So this is the, this is the most important part, uh, like uh, uh, working with humans. But within, within teaching, I think I'm shocked by, I'm shocked by uh, the, the, the information teachers have about motor learning, for example, as an example. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I don't, but even here in Holland, for example, the judo. Mm -hmm. Well, 25 years ago, a friend of mine, Jan Middelkamp, wrote a book, Judo as, judo as Play. Mm -hmm. And he already, he already talked about not, you know, not doing all those, all those isolated drills. Judo is a relational, uh, mm -hmm. re relational martial art. Yes. It's 20, 25 years ago. But we are still doing uh, move one hundred times, move two hundred times, and so on and so on. While there is at the same time a lot of research in motor learning about implicit motor learning, about ecological psychology, about uh, about teaching games, mm -hmm. about about deliberate play. Well, mm -hmm. I, I throw in some concepts, but the thing is. As a teacher, as a prof okay, let me say, as a professional teacher, if you name yourself a teacher, I think it's, I think it's, you yeah, you have to, you have, you have to, um, how do you call it? Invest in this, this yes. kind of, yeah. So um, people have a too small, too small a toolbox, I think. Yes. At the same time, I realize I'm a, I'm a nerd. I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, you know. It's, it's, it's an obsession, so uh, I, I can expect everybody to have the same, uh, how do you call it? Ambition. Ideas, but, yeah. Yeah. For sure. And this is something I think about a lot from motor learning at university, right, is this idea about learning versus performance. Yeah, also, you know, yeah. Right? We, we work towards performance. We go around and we coach people on every little detail until they can perform yeah. the technique of the day perfectly and then a week later they've totally forgotten it because yes. performance is only one small attribute or one small yeah. aspect I should say one aspect of learning 
It needs to be repeatable. It needs to be repeatable in different environments after a a period of time with different opponents. Um, So play or even, um, well, I mean, you can call these all play, right? But games that take sparring and chop some sections off of it. So it's not such a big free canvas where it's like overwhelming and you end up just going back to what you know best anyway, but you can actually develop tools within a certain set of boundaries. So could you give an example of a kind of um, that sort of a game that you might do that would be well aligned to learning in, let's say, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Yeah, well, for example, uh, if, if we talk about, for example, the guard, the guard position yeah, is, is uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows it, but I'm on my back, on my ground, and there is a, the, the, uh, the, the partner is between my legs. Yes. So now you can start, um, you, you can start uh, teaching all kinds of techniques and so on and so on. I'm, I'm not saying this is the wrong way, that, that's mm. not, but you can do it. You can do it another way. You can just ask students, well, this is the situation. Mm-hmm. you are between my legs what is the goal for the for for the top uh, for the top uh, player well the, the goal is to go behind uh, sorry to pass the legs yes you can you can even explain it uh, if you want what is the goal for the other side is uh, keeping it uh, keeping him between your legs mm-hmm. or maybe sweep yes so you have to you have to uh, constrain and eh? this is the constraint that approach so you have mm-hmm. to make it but make it small enough to be challenging. Mm-hmm. And then what, what I do is I start just by, okay, the top position, mm-hmm. try to pass. Mm-hmm. Not with full resistance, but uh, on a scale of one or 10, uh, resistance is, uh, is four, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just, just try to find solutions. Mm-hmm. I call this, um, uh, this is from, uh, this is from uh, Jeet Kune Do, I think. It's the three I method. It's introduce, mm-hmm. isolate, integrate. Mm-hmm. So I, I introduce the problem. Mm-hmm. Then they go, they go, they go, they are trying to, to play the game mm-hmm. uh, and they find solutions. Then, okay, everybody, okay, what did you find? What did you find? What did you find? That show us, okay. Then as a teacher, I isolate some of the solutions mm-hmm. and I give some, some input because mm-hmm. I'm still a teacher and I'm, yes. I, I'm a bit. And then I inter- integrate it again. So, mm-hmm. for example, in, in the guard positions, they, they are very soon discovered that if they push the leg downwards, they can pass. Mm-hmm. Or if they go under the legs, they can uh, set the guard person on his, uh, on his, on his head and so mm-hmm. on and so on. And then we, we, iso- we isolate it. But it's also related to the competence eh, because they have uh, they've done it by themselves. It's out, it's, uh, they have a little autonomy. Mm-hmm. So they feel engaged. Mm-hmm. It's not Eric telling me and I'm doing it. No, they feel engaged and they, come, they can adapt and they feel their own body, mm-hmm. what, what the preferences. Mm-hmm. And then we uh, isolate it and I, uh, we, we give some tips to each other. And you are amazed, I think, Sometimes as teachers, we, we just, we, we're just not aware how smart our students are. Mm-hmm. If you treat them as dump, they are dump, you know? Mm-hmm. But if you give them the safety and, and you, 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 you ask them the right problems, mm-hmm. I mean, problems and play problems, they yes. come up with very good solutions. Mm-hmm. And you can applaud it and you can work on their self-efficacy and their competence. And mm-hmm. that, that's, that's uh, what, what I do. That is so fantastic and really actionable, I think. Yeah, and man, and there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of pleasure and energy because play, as you as we all know, play play is one of the the, the yeah how do you call it the or, origins of learning. If mm-hmm. you, if you look at the evolutionary things on play, but even in polyphagal theory, play mm-hmm. is seen as a neural exercise. Yes, because in in, in uh, if we go back to trauma. I'm not talking about very, very severe trauma, but I mean, I mean like negative experiences, because in play you have to uh, you have to activate your social engagement system at the yes. same time as you are activating your sympathetic system. Mm-hmm. And now you have the beautiful you 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 can be active while not afraid. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um... So for... and there is a, and there's sorry I'm sorry but no, so go, go, go. 
especially in Australia, I'm, I know that there is a, a big movement in teaching games for understanding. I'm not sure if they call it like that, but also they call it game sense or the game mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. Australia was very big on this and, and it's so beautiful. And in our educational, physical education, it's, it's uh, we don't teach lay layups with basketball anymore. We play a small game and then the children say, oh, it's very difficult to hit the basket. Oh, well, here's a suggestion. Yes. So now yes. I'm rattling a little bit. but No, so much yes for this. I often say this to people because they think like, if I don't tell them the exact steps or yeah. if I don't um, correct them on their mistakes, they're going to do it wrong forever. But what you yeah. actually find is if you bite your tongue and sit back and let people experiment, yes. then they come to you exactly like you say. And they say, it doesn't quite feel powerful when I do this. And then we're working together rather than me yeah. seeing it. Of course, I saw the mistake. I'm like a competent yeah. teacher, but I don't need to prove my competence. And that's where no. I think... Uh, it, it can be difficult for some people where their ego is tied up within that, right? They want to get up yeah. and they want to use big words and they want to show they know flashy technique and they can correct all the students many, many times yeah. to prove that they deserve the, the role of teacher, but it's the opposite. It's really- Yeah, and, and, and that, that, that's, uh, that, that's what the, the last sentence. There's also, why do we always feel so important? <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and even beyond that, I'm no, I, I don't know if you're, if you're known with the concept of the hidden curriculum. No, tell everyone. It's called, the, well, the hidden curriculum is while you are teaching, there is a lot of things going on which you do not, which you are not doing explicitly but implicitly. Mm -hmm. So the way you behave, the mm -hmm. way you react to students who come late, and so on and so on. So there is an underlying narrative which they feel much more than the, the, the explicit words you say. Yes. And, and uh, the hidden curriculum also, be, I mentioned it because sometimes we think we have to be in charge and talk all the time and be the, the, the great uh, orator. Mm -hmm. But there is already learning taking place, uh, even without us. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You could put yeah. people in a room without you there yeah. and they would figure out some things. Lots yeah. of things. Yeah. And they would remember it very well too because they worked it out. And it's 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 a little bit of a shame because I, I many times see in martial arts schools when I visit, I uh, I have the impression, but I can be wrong. And I'm mm -hmm. I'm not talking bad about colleagues because they the most of them are doing it uh how do you call it from their heart? Yes. But I have sometimes if I look, if I'm really looking at the faces of the students. It's like, oh, they, they're sitting like sheep, like, uh, oh, uh, I'm not sure if I can say why. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can say, they can say anything. And is the police anything? Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. We are here together we, to find playful solutions or serious solutions. 100%. 100%. And I think that world is getting slightly closer. Um, and certainly it's it's incredible now that there is availability, right? In Holland, people can train with you or they can train yeah. with teachers that have been trained by yes. you and they're going to get uh, yeah. a very different experience of learning martial arts. And I think that yeah. is really wonderful. That is really something to celebrate. Yeah, true. Eric, I know you have two books. Neither of them are in English, but you may as well plug them on the podcast. Um, yeah. is, that, is that correct? Two books, neither of them in English? No, I have four books. Four but, books? Uh, okay. No, there are. Uh, they are not so. The first one is a book for kickboxing teachers. The second one is a book specially written for uh, for education. Mm -hmm. It was a big step. There was mm -hmm. kickboxing, the, the kick of kickboxing. Yep. The third one was box fit. It yes. Was about uh, applying, and the last one was frontline training. This is a book for. Uh, put, no, well, this is, this was actually written for you, but it's unfortunately it's in Dutch. <laughs> it's about uh, it's about it's for teachers. And instructors within police, uh, medicine, uh, military. Yep. And now this is the fifth book mm -hmm. <laughs> is about martial arts and therapy. And is it going to be in English? No. No. Well, well we're going to have to work out how we get funding to get it translated into English. Hmm? Well, that's good you mentioned it because my my fourth book about uh, police ambulance training was also I got a lot of requests from 
US and so on to do it in English, but it would be nice martial arts as therapy, but I'm, uh, no, I'm maybe, I'm not I'm sure, now I'm uh, confused. <laughs> now I'll put you on the spot. Look, we'll talk about it off air. We'll see what yeah. we can make happen. Um, <laughs> yeah. And again, as I say, my biggest regret in life is not learning Dutch, but yeah. we'll make it happen some other way. Um, and if people want to follow you for updates about the, your books being released or your other work, are you available anywhere online, your websites, Instagram, etc.? Yeah. I will, um, I will yeah, send you the, I have a blog called Train the Trainer, mm-hmm. which is especially, especially for trainers and, and coaches and teachers. Yes. We'll put but the you have also, also, please mention the great work of Rob Gray. You know okay. him from motor learning, ecological psychology. It's so great. I mean, it's the greatest resource on motor learning available. Okay, his, pod- his, put that his podcast. The- he, mm-hmm. he has a lot of. It's it's like university in itself. Okay, I mean, if you ju- if you just if you just listen to his podcast, motor learning is. <laughs> okay, are. we've got a lot of re- resources to put in the show notes yeah. from this episode, so I'll be sure to reference um all the things that we spoke about so that people can find them if they so wish. But thank you so much for coming on. This has been a wonderful episode. I've learned a lot. Have you thought of something to be grateful for today? What was it? I am grateful for the amazing women that train with me at the Fight Back Project. I'm grateful for Nari and the beautiful song Shape Me heard at the beginning and end of every episode. And I'm grateful for you for listening to this show and helping martial arts keep saving lives. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you'd like to leave me a review to help more people find the show, that's a bonus. You need to know that nobody shapes me but me. Don't gotta tell you what my name is, I don't gotta explain it Walk in the room, hear a boom erupting like I'm famous I'm here shedding shells, I'm shameless I fear nothing, no complacence Walk to many tight ropes with no hope, so I became this Poster they hold over all the heads of trauma holders You don't need to know my history, I move boulders Atlas shrug, cause I lifted the weight above his shoulders No pretense of defense, move first like chess soldiers This goes deeper than empowerment, cause I'm the one that power it. Physical meets mental challenge me to keep devouring. If I can't change the scenery, at least I change perspectives. No longer isolated, but elevated and selective. Darkest places become beautiful spaces. This is where rage meets patience. Meets power meets gracious. Meets, we're so glad you came in. The feeling is contagious. When you the walking impact of intended bad intentions. When you the manifesting of collecting all they tensions. You the soul and body hold it all and still remember. But I'm a work in progress, testament to all contenders. Forgot what it was like to have control over self. Forgot what it was like to be the one in charge. Forgot in my reflection, I can see all my wealth. Forgot that with my bare hands, I break all these bars, barriers, and obstacles. They can't cage me, they can't chronicle all my experiences and reduce them to appearances. When I was truly beaten, gave myself clearances to fall down, mess up, and get myself back up. I'm not looking for clovers, cause I don't believe in luck. Damn, you were badass, I heard them say it clearly. Why, thank you very much, I know now I'm not weary of what's next for me, cause I expect to see growth like I was planted, watered, fed, and bloomed to be the positivity and accountability. No one they won't step if I'm the agent of my agency. I think I found my voice again, huh? I think I found my voice again, huh? I'm not sorry, I'm not sorry, you're the end where I begin. Boundaries, I know them well. Take a breath and meditate. Who is she? I know her well. Now I get to open gates. One, two, one, two. I don't need your permission. And if you get uncomfortable, then use your intuition to know that I won't stay where respect is ever missing. And everything I do, that's me making decisions. It's truly underrated, the value of self-worth. Forgot that I was rich from the moment of my birth. A penny for my thoughts, no reason. You can't afford it, you cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it. You cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it, huh?